Thank you very much for the invitation. I feel very privileged to be here with you. Uh, and as I say to uh, Christoph, I said I will, I will come to Orthodox Institute uh, to deliver paper only if it's in person, rather than to sit in my room and read paper. So there is no point. So uh, I think uh, uh, we agree about that very easily. So my topic uh, has a very bombastic title, and I will come with very bombastic thesis here because I'm Eastern European, so I don't have to be like decent English and polite and have this nice accent. I can just start like with, with artillery and, and, and try to express myself in, in a way because I think what Georgia Gambin is doing, it's, it's extremely important, I think, especially for the students who are online, perhaps one of the interesting topics for doing PhD will be very interesting idea to do orthodox theology and Giorgio Agamben, for example. I think that will be very, very good uh, PhD that I will be more than happy to supervise uh, with uh, Dr. Schneider here. But uh, uh, I think that that will be interesting. Let me let me say just a couple of things. I will talk maybe around 40 minutes. I will have a two, two big quotations. Uh, I will not uh, try to read very fast. I will try to say a couple of jokes only to be funny for the sake of being funny so that it's not boring. Uh, and after maybe 40 minutes, uh, I will give some uh, space for you to ask uh, or to make some comments or to simply see your allergical reactions on Giorgio Agamben thought or on my presentation. So let's start. Giorgio Agamben, Biopolitical Emergency Minority Report. Giorgio Agamben is one of the most important living philosophers and he knows more theology than average academic theo uh, theologian. This is one of these bombastic theses that I already started. So this is what makes him most perfect theological converser. His biography and his bibliography are impressive. Perhaps this is the reason why there is no easy entrance in his serpentine, profound, and very original thought. Today, when the word, when the word controversial is easily thrown on everyone or everything, it will be offensive to call Agamben controversial. He is beyond ordinary idea of controversy, and it is a trivial to call him a subversive thinker, but perhaps he is both. He dares to go where angels feel uncomfortable. His thought contains something profoundly disturbing and prophetic. Intensive, like a massive grinder and redemptive at the same time, there is something subtle suiting, almost graceful in his, and in the same time, something dangerous in his thought. Something like a pharmacon, which we must take with the art of dosage to navigate his discursive, meandering line of thoughts. In today's presentation, we will tackle Angamben's concept of biopolitics and the concept of the state of emergency, mostly known as the state of exception. In the first part of my presentation, I will discuss what, what is biopolitics for Michel Foucault in relation to Agamben's usage of the same concept. In the second part of the presentation, I will reflect about state of exception articulated by Carl Schmitt and how Agamben critically unfolds Schmittian argument in order to clarify our contemporary political situation. And in third part, I will offer possible theological reading and assessment of Agamben's work with the possibility of unfolding his thought. This theological reading of Agamben will be based on his theological writings. My attempt to read his theological writings, I called Minority Report. One of the most, one of the first obstacles in our approach to philosophical archaeology of Agamben's project is his debt to Michel Foucault. Their thoughts are intertwined in the best and perhaps uh, uh, most complicated way. After all, Foucault coined the neologism biopolitics that Agamben systematically investigate and explicate in his multi-voluminous project Homo Sacer. This is how Agamben is summarized his research process that I will apply in this paper. This is a long quotation, so please bear with me. After many years spent reading, writing, and studying, it happens at the times that we understand what is our special way, if there is one of proceeding in thought and research. In my case, it is a matter of perceiving what Feuerbach called capacity for development, capacity for development, contained in the work of the authors I love. The genuinely philosophical element contained in the work, be it an artistic, scientific, or theoretical work, 
is a capacity to be developed, something that has remained or has willingly been left unspoken and that needs to be found and sized. Why does search for this element susceptible to being developed fascinate me? Because if we follow this methodological principle all the way, we end up at a point where it is not possible to distinguish between what is ours and what belongs to the author we are reading. Reaching this impersonal zone of indifference in which every proper name, every copyright, every claim to originality fade away fills me with joy. Let us then proceed and investigate what has remained unsaid in Michel Foucault's thought on biopolitics according to Agamben. Foucault will describe the problem of biopolitics as the art of governing through which desired form of citizenship is produced. It is about producing citizenry that would voluntarily adopt certain political rationality of capitalistic governing. This means that biopolitics operates in a set of highly sophisticated power knowledge relations in between state apparatus. From one side, and disciplinary procedures that makes basic biological forms of human species a general object of control and political strategy from other. Sorry for this sausage, that's a big, big sentence, but I will sort of try to read it once again. So he says that basically, uh, biopolitics operates in, in coordinate system made of two, uh, uh, two important points. One is that uh, it is a sophisticated power, power and knowledge relationship in the state apparatus. And that's the one. And the second is a um, disciplinary procedure that makes basic biological forms of human species object of political strategy. Or as Michel Foucault simply concluded, he said, modern man is an animal whose politics calls in his existence as a living being into question. For Foucault, biopolitics is a disciplinary practice of regulating population and territory that arouse arose in a parallel with the development of capitalism and modern nation state. Beginnings of biopolitics could be traced to pre-revolutionary absolutist uh, practice that it's called uh, uh, physiocrats who reintroduced art of te and technology of governing, so-called governmentality. Consequently, biopolitics is technology for managing public health that extends to the management of private property in relation to the issues of inheritance and control of birth and death using utilitarian procedures to in include and exclude people uh, or population. No wonder what Foucault will articulate something that can be motto of his militant political thought. Foucault will say, I refuse to be governed. Or to put it differently, what he said in one of the interviews, Foucault says, I prefer not to identify myself which I think it's a very interesting quotation, especially for so-called liberal left, when they, they are so obsessed with identity positions that Foucault says, I refuse to be identified. I refuse to identify my position from where I'm speaking. Both thoughts are signified, significant for Agamben, and they can be interpretative categories of his own understanding of biopolitics. Agamben's project is to correct and complete Foucault, as he clearly stated. Classical Greek language has the two morphologically and semantically distinct terms for life, bios and zoe. Zoe represents biological, non-qualified life. It is a fact of living, common to living beings. As such, whether they are animals or humans or plants, bios is on other side, is a qualified life. Bios is a mode of good life, life lived well, that, that is a proper to individual or concrete group of people. Following Aristotle and Corpus Hippocraticum, Agamben will talk about life as bios because bios is not medical scientific category, but primary bios is socio-political one. It is very interesting that when we read Corpus Hippocraticum, which is Bible for uh, medical uh, 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 scholars, that when author is talking about life, he's very rarely talking about life in a biological sense. Although they are trying to heal and cure people, they talk about life as a bios. This is, this is very, very, I think, interesting, uh, 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 interesting point. Bios is about good life rather than life in biological mode. 
For Aristotle, man is a living animal with capacity for political existence. His capacity is to, to act and to contemplate and to, do, to, to live good life. In this simple but significant distinction between Bios and Zoe, we should look for Agamben's specific approach to politics and its metamorphosis into something what it's called biopolitics. For him, for Agamben, Bios is a, is a mode of process. It is act that intensifies possibilities of life. Life is always potential. Human life, for our Italian, is not simply fact, but always and above all, it is a possibility of life, life of potential, as he sometimes said. So we are still becoming human. Life as anthropogenesis is inseparable from form, and it is impossible to isolate it something that is just bare life. History of Western politics is nothing else than merging bios, bios into zoe, where zoe will become dominant expression of life. So we almost uh, uh, took out this good life, life lived well, social aspect of life. And for us, life is reduced simply to zoe, to biological component. Politics failed to become practice that gives form to good life. When, pol when possibilities and potentialities of life are controlled and disciplined, Agamben says, this is when we talk about biopolitics. When life as a good life is controlled, disciplined, put in sort of a, a, a aspect of a spectacle, we talk about uh, biopolitics. Agamben claims the classical philosophical distinction between bios and zoe will be challenged and redefined by, Plot by uh, uh, Plotinus in the third century AD, which is very interesting. In relation to Aristotle, Plotinus will suddenly propose new ontology. In order to do that, he will weaken distinction between zoe and bios, and he will gradually substitute zoe for bios. In Plotinus, Zoe will consequently acquire a whole range of semantic meanings that will give birth to our modern understanding and interpretation of life. One of the 20th century uh, uh, thinkers whom Agamben appreciates and likes, uh, Croatian, it happens to be Croatian, even Illich, he, he used to talk about life as a medicalized life. What we do today with life we just talk that in medical categories. We just reduce it to purely medical categories. Plotinus will talk about form of life, and according to Agamben, he will provide a new definition of life, connected with Zoe, of course, uh, that will uh, uh, be transmitted into Western theology and politics. It is important that uh, Pl Pl Plotinian concept of life and form of life will be, as I say, transmitted into Western politics by early church fathers, uh, Western church fathers, uh, Ambrose of Milan, and particularly Augustine of Hippo. Uh, the key person who, who made this transmission sort of visible, according to Agamben, is Marius Victorinus, a Roman rhetor who translated Plotinus from Greek into Latin, because as we know, uh, that was the first uh, translation, and uh, Plotinus was one of the authors whom Augustine read prior to his conversion, because he says in, in the text, in Confessions, that he read some of the Platonic Libri, which is, means uh, uh, not Plato, uh, but probably that was Plotinus. Uh, so Victorinus, in his writings against Arians, will massively employ Pl Plotinian bioontological vocabulary. Victorinus will employ Plotinian concept of life to express consubstantiality of father and son. This is interesting because in the Western Neoplatonism, we have a different idea and different ways how to tackle the problem of homoousios. And Marius Victorinus is, is not very attractive as an author, extremely boring. Pierre Ado says that he spent 30 years and he throw it 30 years of his life reading Marius Victorinus because it's incredibly boring. But uh, uh, one of the reasons uh, uh, why he matters is because he sort of a... a, a, a he, he paved the way that Western theology will talk about life. That's, that's what Agamben tried to say. And uh, what, what comes out of the Mario, Marius Victorinus and then eventually Augustine and Western theology is that the, theologians will talk about two kinds of life, 
life that we live and life by means of which we live. So this is the sort of a, 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 a first part of my uh, 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 presentation. Out of this presentation, I will sort of uh, uh, deduce a couple of a uh, uh, couple of points worthy to to reflect. Simply that uh, that we can uh, perhaps easily follow what what comes. First, our modern understanding of life is reduced to biological life. That's the first point. Second, life we live is not only expression of biology, but it is the form of life, how to live well. That's a gamba. So it's not that we should talk about life uh, in biological sense, but how should we live well? That's, that's the way how should we talk about life, according to Agamben. Third, the, to live life well is a life of potential and possibilities. Furthermore, everything that controls and discipline this form of life is biopolitics. In order to prove this, Agamben is using theology as investigative procedure. So for him, he's a philosopher, but he's using theological discourse in order to prove his philosophical point, which I think it's interesting because it seems then that theology is a master discourse. That's the first, if you try to prove something else with theology, but that's, that's I think, open for debate. And last but not least, uh, uh, as I said, theology is for him paradigmatic investigative procedure. This is important segment for understanding his thought. So, in order to understand Agamben's concept of politics, not biopolitics, but politics, it is not surprising that he understand that his understanding of politics is echoing the famous Carl Schmitt maxim that all concepts of modern political theory of state are secularized concepts coming from theology. This is very, very interesting position from Carl Schmitt, that all concepts from modern political theory of the state are the secularized concepts coming from theology, whether it's Eastern or Western, it does not matter in this case. If this is true, and Agamben believes it is, not only Agamben, but for example, Ernest Kantorov, it's one of the, one of the greatest uh, 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 conservative uh, of 20th century, who was a, a, a scholar who wrote excellent study of medieval political theology, uh, who is sort of a same Catholic Roman, uh, I'm sorry, uh, apocalyptic re counter revolutionary as, as, as a Carl Schmitt. So to repeat this, it is necessary that all concepts of modern state theory are coming from secularized theology. If this is true, that's, th th there is something dis profoundly disturbing there. But let, let me continue because the best things are already, they are just, just coming. Not only because Carl Schmitt is the most important theoretician of the state of exception, uh, Schmitt is one of the greatest legal theorists of the 20th century. And he introduced the concept of something what we call political theology. So that's the second thing. And the third, he had a famous public debate with the Catholic convert theologian Eric Peterson in order to sort of uh, uh, defend his position, not Jordan Peterson, uh, 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 but because, you know, he, he is a you know, drug addict. He was on benzodiazepine, I guess. That's what I've heard when I read things about him. But Eric Peterson, that's, that's a different person. So, so let, let us sort of a back on, on Agamben's politics. Agamben's politics is, depre is depressing. This is what we can hear here from the left political spectrum today. It's very depressing, they say. It is pessimistic and he does not give any solution, solutions or answers, as I heard a couple, couple of times from lefty propagand propagandists. Personally, I was on these conferences among my radical left friends, and they will say, oh, Agamben, that's depressing, that's a pessimistic, oh, he's, he, he does not give any answers. But I think this is a very superficial way of reading Giorgio Agamben. They, they use simply mantras like this. We are all homo sacer. It is a person who, who, whom is allowed to kill according to old Roman law, homo sacer or homo sacer, in concentration camp during the state of exception. This is what they repeat. This is sort of a kind of a uh, uh, superficial 
uh, summary of what he tried to say in his uh, huge project. This is caricature, caricature of a Gambin's political theory, of course. Uh, for different reasons, pessimism and, and, and optimism are not philosophical categories, so we should not talk about them here in this context. Perhaps there is something opposite than pessimism in his understanding of politics that is full of joy in Spinozian sense, something even more humorous, like a Plotinus proposing in his famous treatise on contemplation when Plotinus said, let us, for the sake of joke, say that everything that lives contemplates. It's a joke, it's, it's, but it's still there. It's a very important text. In Spinozian mode, Agamben would propose contemplating potentials of life, not as passivity, not as activity, but as inoperativity. This term is one of the most important of his political thought, inoperativity. Before we turn to Carl Schmitt, let us remind ourselves how Agamben thinks about contemporary politics. In his small, small book called Stasis, Agamben will try to provide only one argument, and this is that, that we live, paradigmatically, of course, that's a para paradigm, that we live in permanent global civil war. I wrote this paper before bombing of, of Ukraine, so it's kind of like that we are coming there. But he says, for him, civil war on a global scale is a paradigm for thinking contemporary politics. Modern Leviathan, in the name of security, promotes surveillance, not to keep order, but through the ideology of security, managing disorder, producing permanent crisis. So what, what he basically says, he says that, uh, that modern Leviathan, modern nation state does not keep order, but they basically they are managing disorder. They're managing disorder through ideology of security. Everything is based on security. Take off your pants at the airport because of your security. And we just do that. We don't even ask questions. Like we just simply do, well, can you imagine yourself and, to, and say, I don't want to have security. I think they will take you in the asylum. They, they will think that you are insane. I don't want to be secure, for, just to, for the sake of joke, you say this, but because today ideology of security is that everything what state is doing is in the name of security. That's what Agamben would say. So in order to produce permanent crisis, he says this is, this is very important context. So word crisis in Greek is, is very interesting because we use it in three ways, one in theology, one in medicine, and, and one in a, a legal practice. In theology, the word crisis comes when Je it's time of parousia, when Jesus comes, so it's revealed. And in law, it is when judge give verdict after studying the facts. And in, in the medicine, when doctor is deciding terminal situation, reading symptoms, and he says sick or not sick or cured, you know, this is this sort of a idea of crisis. So diacrisis, to see through crisis, for, because word crisis today, according to Agamben, is ideological jargon that represents interior drive of capitalistic machine. This interior motor of capitalistic machine is working as a mechanism of permanent state of exception. Governments and societies have all legal, not always legitimate instruments. This is what he says. They are doing legal things, but are they legitimate? Right? This, this is important. They have all legitimate instruments of juridical power to impose normalization of something that is state of exception. So second part. Here we're coming to Carl Schmitt, theoretician of the state of exception or emergency uh, state. Carl Schmitt, this Catholic romantic and apocalyptic counter revolutionary who did not like, he did not like liberal democracy. Actually, he hated liberal democracy, provided legal structure for the state of exception in the Third Reich. His work, has been take, uh, his work has to be taken seriously, not only to understand the Gamben, but to understand much of 20th century theology, politics, and law theory. For him, law is not norm, but exception. It's very interesting. It's exception that tells us how law, law is functioning, rather than law as such. This is the first thesis that we should take in consideration. In order to grasp consequences of the thesis, we should, we should say that according to Schmidt, sovereign is the one who decides what is time of exception. 
he can proclaim this is the time of exception. This is the state of emergency as, as, we, as we know it. It is a, what is the state of emergency? What does it mean according to greatest theoretician of law of 20th century, Carl Schmitt? It is suspension of law in the name of order. We suspend the law in order to keep order. <laughs> Sovereign has legitimate power to suspend the rule of law and to legally create procedures for people to be excluded from the rule of law. For example, their citizenship can be taken away without any further explanation, and they are proclaimed enemy of the state. Paradoxically, sovereign is simultaneously outside and inside a law. What does it mean practically? Agamben is showing us extreme case of Nazi Germany, where, they have, uh, where for, the, for the time when Nazis came to power, we have a permanent state of exception for 13 years in order to exterminate certain citizens, Jews, Roma people, communists, mentally ill, according to Nazi standards, homosexuals, perhaps Slavic people, and all other inferior races. The first step is that you have to put them outside of the rule of law. Concentration camps are paradoxically outside of law, which means they are not officially territory of the Third, third Reich in the legal sense. They represented life that is not worthy living, or as it, one of the, as, as it was suggested by some scholars, scholars of that time, life devoid of value. Agamben would also say that, for example, Guantanamo Bay today is the, in the same position. It is outside the rule of law. People try to close it down, but because someone studied Carl Schmitt so good, so that it's impossible, because that's really example of legal case that Guantanamo is outside of rule of law. So you can reduce human beings on animals there and do, you know, you can hold them for 10 years without indictment, you know, because you suspect that they are terrorists. If they are, you should prove that. If they are not, you should leave them. That's, that's it. You know, that's not to torching them with heavy metal music or something. Uh, beat them every day. As what, that was in this movie. So Agamben used this, uh, uh, you know, the, what life devoid of value. This is the famous Nazi syntagma. The race is genetic, hereditary, and nothing else. Agamben used this phrase ironically, since legality of the state of exception is heavily supported by state science, where the group of scientists will prove a race inferiority of Jews, Roma people, or Slavs based on, on their hereditary biology. Everything what happened in the Third Reich is a consequence of the state of exception with the legal signature of Karl Schmidt, who was kicked out of the Nazi inner circle in the 30s. He kept his teaching position as professor of law, but after, uh, after the war, he was under the house arrest where he will finish his opus magnum, uh, uh, Nomos of the Earth. Interesting point about Karl Schmidt is that while he was in a, in, in, in a house arrest, one of the leading Jewish thinkers called uh, Jacob Taubes used to visit him and they will read a letter to Romans together. And people will be surprised about this very weird and strange friendship of ex, ex sort of a Nazi right winger and Jewish left winger philosopher. And people will say, like, what are you doing together? Like, why, why are you doing this? He says, well, we don't like people in the political center. So that's sort of how we discuss our thoughts, right? So it, it is interesting because uh, uh, Carl Schmidt uh, wrote the book Nomos of the Earth, which is he put foundations for something what it's called international law. It is very interesting that he was never prosecuted in Nuremberg. Uh, one of the reasons, it's my opinion, you know, uh, is that he knew more law than all of the judges at Nuremberg courts together. Nomos of the Earth is a frightening, frightening book because you don't have to know law theory in, in order to understand it. It's so clearly written. It is so profound that it's scary uh, how, how good as author he is, you know, how clear uh, uh, he is. And in many ways, he put foundation for something what we call international law today. So that's, that's, that's a very, very interesting. And of course, as I say, He's the father of political theology. He coined the term. He put it in the, in the public space. 
why does it matter for Agamben, this idea of permanent state of exception? You know, like why state exception matter for Agamben? Why, why he, he says, after reading Heidegger for many years, he said, I discovered Walter Benjamin and he saved me from Heidegger. And he finds something very instructive in Benjamin's thought in his thesis on philosophy of history. The text uh, that will cause trouble for lefty Benjamin, who was a Jew and tried to run away from Germany, but also he was trying to run away from the Stalinist killer, killers and he drank the poison at the Spanish border because he knew that his visa was declined so he could not go to States. So it is interesting that uh, if, if right-wing politics hates you and left-wing politics wants to kill you, it means you are good. We have to read you. I mean, if both sides hate you, you know, they want to kill you. There is something there that it must be read, I, I guess, right? So Walter Benjamin saved him, saved me from Heidegger. That's what he said a, a, a couple of times. So why, what, what, what was this saving power of, of Benjamin's thought? Uh, basically, Agamben says that in 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 Benjamin, uh, uh, he find confirmation that what we live it is not just thirteen times of state of exception is in in the Third Reich, but uh, Agamben is convinced that state of exception become a new normal. This is illusion that we live in a time of global civil war. After all, this is not just Benjamin thesis. Agam Foucault said something similar where he claims that for, for the long time, we live in the context where privileges of sovereign power are exercised on population. Sovereign powers have a privilege to decide on matters related to life and death. Agamben built his arguments with Benjamin and Foucault. He claims that governments today run our countries and societies based on emergency measures through security degrees and police interventions. Dual machine of law and management is reduced to measures of management according to Agamben. He says, we don't have a law today. Everything is management. That's, that's, that's his sort of a, a, a argument. Is there any, anything as a strategy in Agamben thought that is worth it to think in order to deactivate this dual machine between law and management? between this sort of a, a legality that, that is in a place and, and uh, uh, measures of, of manage, you know, like governing people through, through managerial procedures. So this is, this is the sort of where we go to the third part of my presentation. So is there, is there any sort of a material inside a gamben that it will kind of a called in a question this, what is what we witnessing today. For Agamben, Machiavelli's Prince, Spinoza's Ethics and Guy Debord's Society of Spectacle are not only philosophical books. These authors are strategies for him, and this is how he read them. However, we know as much as strategy is important in a war and in the peacetime, logistics is equally important, if not more important in this context. What are the Agamben's logistical maneuvers? First, it's very interesting that, that Agamben is always criticizing left rather than right. He's left, he's radical left, but he's criticizing left. I think that there is, that's very interesting. First, Agamben is, crit, uh, his critique of self-imposed limitation of leftist politics to its own discourse. Problematic position of leftist politics, that's what he said, and the workers' movements is that they are sharing the same concepts with their ideological enemies represented by capitalistic rationality or market. He says, basically, you leftists, my, my friends, you are using the same language terminology as a capitalistic machine. Words like productivity, work, a cooperativity. This is exactly what they are doing. Agamben's idea is to construct new conceptual framework where it is possible to use concepts of inoperativity, impotentiality, or deactivation, and present and present it as a form of praxis or poesis. Second, idea of deactivation means to render something ineffective, to make something ineffective. For example, turning weapons into tools, tools into weapons when it's needed. For Agamben, deactivation is logistic gesture, and he gives example of play. 
So what happens when we see children playing or if we play with our children? Let's say you have a little child who takes plastic container where we have contained food. He take it out and start playing and pretending or using it as a, as a vehicle or car or airplane or even boat. So which means that he rendered it inoperative. He made it different because he repurposed it. He used it for a different purpose. What Agamben is telling us, he says that we should use exactly the same method as rules of play to deactivate this sort of a, a ontological machine or capitalistical machine or something that we see as a sort of a, what constrain our thoughts. We have to deactivate that system of, of thought. So, uh, uh, it means to, uh, this, this is the reason why Agamben is talking about Greek word kresis. In his last book, The Use of Bodies, he, he has a whole chapter of the word, of Greek word kresis, which means use. And he asks himself, is it possible that we develop a certain way of using things without claiming that we own them? Is it possible to use things in a different way? Whatever we have. And it, it, as much as it seems like almost banal question, there is some profound depth there that, that, that sort of a lurking and, and provoke us. And I will, I will play with that a little bit later. He is questioning himself whether there is a possible to develop specific way of using without owning. Like, and he, he dedicated the whole book to call highest poverty to the rule of life made by Franciscan monks, because they will use certain things, but they will not own them because they give vow of poverty. So they will use things, but they will not own them. So he, he says there is something there that, you know, once again, theology can provide certain ideas uh, uh, for us. Or he will say, like example in poetry, let's say that sometimes poem can take us beyond language. It can express something that even ordinary language cannot say. And in that sense, it can make language inoperative, which means it deactivates the role of language and opens some new possibilities for us to sort of experience reality in that poem that was not known for us before. Or he will say, he says, even our bodies, like he says, mouth we are using for eating and, and talking. And he says, but when we kiss someone, we are using mouth in a way that is different than just our biological needs like, you know, eating and so, okay. Third, third is perhaps the more interesting for our presentation because it comes from a theological discourse in order to show what does it mean to deactivate something or to make it inoperative. Agamben is rereading Book of Romans. Actually, he read only first six words of the first chapter. This is his most profound theological work and it can be, spe in specific way, summarize all his theological investigations. Plus, this book is an excellent example of his archaeological method. Agamben is thinking in paradigms, and Apostle Paul is not only a great thinker or, thinker or master theologian, Paul is a paradigm. His reading of Paul's letter can be summarized partially as a reading Paul with Jacob Taubes, Martin Heidegger, Stanislas Breton, Alain Badiou, and of course, Walter Benjamin. And once again, Benjamin came to save him. Uh, in his thesis on philosophy of history, uh, there is a first thesis, which is memorable, and many, so many authors play with this first thesis, so I will kind of tell you what it's all about. He says, there was a story that, written by Edgar Allan Poe, actually, that there was a constructed very special machine where uh, on the top of the machine, there was a play chess, a uh, uh, table for chess, and there was a, a puppet look like a Turkish guy who is smoking nargilas uh, and he's playing chess because inside the chess is a kind of ugly dwarf and he's pulling the strings and everyone who sits to play chess with a you know, Turkish guy with a puppet, losing game because puppet, uh, a dwarf inside the machine is a master, you know, a grandmaster of the chess. And he says this, that's a Benjamin's explanation. He says, uh, 
puppet is a materialistic philosophy. And everyone who try to play chess or who try to beat materialistic philosophy will lose it only because theology is this ugly dwarf who is pulling the, pulling the games, you know, pulling the moves in a chess, right? And which would, what Benjamin would try to say, he says, theology is so ugly and bad, nobody will hire her for any public discourse, uh, but only materialistic philosophers are kind of smart enough to take theology seriously. That was his argument in the first thesis. Agamben says that ugly dwarf is Apostle Paul. He says he is the master theologian. In his book on the Romans, he says, Paul is the one who always wins any debate, whoever sit to play with chess with him. Once I was, I, I said, I explained that, uh, uh, famous uh, Benjamin's theory uh, uh, at one of our reading group, group at uh, VHI at St. Edmunds College. And her, uh, her majesty, uh, Reverend Dr. Sarah Cockley asked me, Boris, why this Leninist are reading Apostle Paul? And, and I think if, if you don't get it, you know, what Benjamin is telling us or what Agamben is telling us, it's difficult to explain it. Because what Agamben is telling us is that Paul is a master theologian. He is the one whom we should read in order to sort of even defeat anyone who try to play tricks against us. Basically, that's 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 the whole story. In that's how the you know beginning of of Romans uh, is is starting. So in his commentary on Romans, Agamben is using using it as a trigger to present to us how he read. Paul in general, and why, is, why Paul is enormously important in his project. When Paul tells us that Messiah did not abolish, but fulfill the law, Agamben read the word katargeo, not as abolishing law, but he's looking for philological, etymological meaning of the word, which Paul is using 26 times in his writings in the New Testament, only 27 times, one, one more time is mentioned in, in the New Testament. He's reading, Agamben's reading is a, is a search for semantic meaning of kata aergon, which it's very interesting because kata aergon means to make law inoperative, to deactivate law. It has to be deactivated in order to be open for different use. This must be ergon. That means that ergon and its energeia have to be preserved in order to be fulfilled. That's what Agamben thinks. It is a progression towards something better. Katargesis does not simply mean to abolish, it means to preserve and bring to fulfillment. Word has a double meaning. And this is, and this is the reason why Luther uses the word Aufhebung, a concept that Hegel will use in, dialectical project, in his dialectical project. Agamben once again ironically makes the point that he Hegel's weapons against theology, Hegel says it's a delightful verb for speculative thought. So Hegel's weapons against theology is forged by theology and by master theologian Paul, and this weapon is genuinely messianic. Messianic practice makes law inoperative. And this is not destruction of law, as we saw it, but it is the activation of law and repurposing it for a different purpose. This idea that this, this is not just theological insight. It can be, this idea of deactivation, according to Agamben, means that it can be transmitted into theory or into practice uh, that is a crucial aspect of messianic community. First step in deactivation of inner structure of law, second step is to messianic application of that action in his community. And the third step is presented as a concept of recapitulation in the letter to Ephesians chapter one, verses 10. Recapitulating everything in the Messiah is another complex concept where repetition is better than original act because everything is put under one head of the Messiah where God will be all in all. This topic has enormously important influence on authors like Irenaeus, Origen, Leibniz, and Kierkegaard. How this deactivation looks ethically. This is explanation uh, uh, that Paul 
uh, Paul is using in the first chapter of, of uh, uh, letter to Corinthians. What Paul is using is, is the text from the second Ezra, which is translation, it's a text, uh, intertestament text, Deuter canonical text from uh, Vulgate. Uh, and he's using this text, Paul is using this text and rephrase it, making some allusion, and I will not read it, but what Paul says, you know, uh, uh, in, in Corinthians, you know that text, but I will read it simply just to remind you. He says, I mean, brothers and sisters, that appointed time has grown, grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as, as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is a passing away. We who belong to messianic community are called to live like we are not doing things. Prosme, that's a Greek word. Like it says, let even those who live, who, who have, have wives, be as though they had none. It's like to be like, to do something like you are not doing. It is not passivity or activity pure and simple. It is doing, it is a doing as we are not doing it. It is a different kind of doing because time is short. Benjamin and Agamben both have small essays called Capitalism as Religion. And in, they are in, in a way, they have the same title, but they are very similar. But both texts have capability to be developed in interesting direction. So if capitalism is religion, as both of them will say, perhaps the most brutal and most militant critic of capitalism can come from religion that gives birth to capitalism, which is Christianity, of course. We can conclude here in Agam in Agambenian way, to live prosme, like we are not. To live like we are not is not fatalistic escapism or mystic nihilism. It is a form of life that contemplates its own potential to do something and not to do something and find joy in it. This is a paraphrase of, of one of the last sentences in Spinoza's ethics. This is how Agamben is finishing his huge project. He said, I did not finish project, I abandoned it. So typical for Italian philosopher. However, he is ending his large project with the peace and joy. That, that can perhaps be one way for us to finish, or perhaps, with the story that Agamben presented in one of the small, small book called The Fire, The Tale and Fire. So fasten your seat belts. We are landing now, just you know, one minute to go, and we are finished. So the story goes like this. When Baal Shem, founder of Hasidism, had a difficult task before him, he would go to the certain place in the woods, light fire, and meditate in prayer. And what he had set out to perform was done. When generation later, Magid of Meseritz was faced with the same task, he would go to the same place in the woods and say, we can no longer light a fire, but we can pray. And everything happened according to his will. When another generation has passed, Rabbi Moshe Leib of Sasov was faced with the same task. And he would go to the same place in the woods and say, we can no longer light a fire, nor do we know the secret meditations belonging to the, to the prayers, but we know the place in the woods, and that can be sufficient. And sufficient it was. But when another generation has passed, and Rabbi Israel of Rishin was called upon the performed task, he sat down in a golden chair in his castle and said, we cannot light the fire, we cannot speak the prayers, we don't know the place, but we can tell the story. And of all of this, we can tell the story of all this. And once again, that was sufficient. So let this story be sufficient for our discussion this evening. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was real to the fourth <laughs> uh, Our government work, that's great. Uh, Not easy, but I, I try to be... Uh, 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 most accessible as, as I could sure, because no. he's not easy author as, as no, you know. Thank you very much. Uh, fantastic. Uh, extremely stimulating. I have lots of questions, but of course, 
Okay. Yes. Um, open the floor to our yes. online or on-site um, tenants. Maybe uh, I understand if you need a few minutes to collect your thoughts. <laughs> Because uh, it was almost like bombarding you, you know, metaphorically, because it's just like fire hosing with information. But that's that's how he's writing. You know, when when you read some some of his texts, it's almost you are in a grinder. You know, you just have to sort of stay and 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 think through and and uh, um, almost like as I say, meditate and 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 because there is so many things there, and uh, and he's very good in hiding his uh, sources. What he's reading. Not a question, just just a comment. Uh, the what happened in Canada during these three weeks, you know, this uh, uh, emergency act was uh, 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 activated. It is above the law, of course, and it is actually a law less. It is, it is, of course, it is, uh, you know, uh, against uh, human, of course, against the, the, the civilians of that, that country. Um, uh, everybody was pointed to to the about this. His, uh, his centers and people, but he put his, uh, he himself in the position above that law, of course. That's that's a part of the just, problem. It, it, and just it is just sort of textbook. Yes. It, it, yes. What right. you, you read. It, it 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 was just his it, it looks like he, he read it. Yes. And it was yes. textbook. Yes. Yeah, unfortunately. That's that sounds that's the scariest part. Yeah. That's there are so many examples. Yes. That's the problem. It's just one <laughs> after the other. For and this is his argument. He says yeah, we have just this is the permanent crisis. That's how we function. That's what we are doing today. And and so his theory conspiracies. He is this. He is that. You know, calling him names. Of course, you know, you can call him names, but, but that doesn't change anything. Yeah, you know, this is like this is what we see. In a way, you know, you mentioned Guantanamo Bay. Yeah. But you can argue that in a way the whole war on terror. Yes. Is a state of exception. Of because course. I remember, of course, September 11. They asked, as the Americans asked uh, the Taliban to extradite Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm. And they said, Yes, can you provide a paper showing like evidence that really he was the guy who mm -hmm. committed these crimes? And they never did it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. so they went they went to war without actually providing, and they didn't extradite Osama bin Laden. So they went to war without having any kind of actually clarified legally that you know this I think, is the perpetrator. I think one of one of the, the, the cases because uh, uh, for for years, I'm I'm following what Agamben is doing. I had a privilege to meet him. We spent a couple of nights uh, in, in in discussing certain things. And I asked him, like, can you know, can you tell me how should I read you uh, in order to understand what you really say? You know, because I don't want to misinterpret you. You know, now you are here. Finally, you know, we are having a very nice dinner. And and you know, so sometimes it's not very philosophical when you discuss about Agamben, and then you say just, well, he told me so, like, you know, he said to me that, so I know it's not that I'm his official interpreter, I don't, you know, I don't care for this, but simply, but idea is like, for example, Guantanamo Bay is one of, you have this very famous case, it's called Taxi Driver for Peshiva, that it is one of the, it, it's so interesting for me, I, 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 I've heard it about it many times, and, and it's, it's uh, this is almost like, uh, uh, if it is true, it's horrible, it's a fun anecdote, it's even more horrible, so I don't know it, which one is worse. The guy, uh, 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 there was a guy who was a taxi driver, and they suspect that he was uh, in, in, in during the certain uh, ride that he was taking some terrorists who were committed certain terroristic act. And his son next day came and took his father's taxi, and he was driving it, and then he was seized and extradited because he was accused that he drove the taxi that perhaps during his father's shift. There was some terrorists there, and he ended up in Guantanamo. Incredible. Uh, and, and basically, he's like, you know, he, he was a taxi driver taking his father's taxi. So it's not like, like, okay, you know, there was a train and there was a terrorist in train. So what, what does it mean? Should we take the driver in the prison because they were, you know, you know, it's kind of almost absurd. But as I say, concerning legality, Guantanamo is a perfect place. It's very legal. There, there is nothing illegal there. That's, that's a part of the challenge, I think, with this. Uh, yes. Oh, yes, sorry. sorry. One often forgets the online. Go ahead. 
Jeremy? Yes, very, very. Okay, yes. thank you. Absolutely fantastic presentation, wonderful. Um, so I, I, I don't really have a question. I, I have, as you said, been bombarded, but I have uh, four, four comments. Yes. The first, you started out early talking about, um, it was almost about matter as being motive, process, and potential. Excuse me, um, what? You were talking about mode of process and potential? Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, and um, I, I'm looking at the cosmos right now in relation to uh, um, Olivier Clément, who I'm working on. Yes. And so I'm looking at the logos and the logoi. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, uh, Yanara says that the Logos is relational, it's dialogal, and he looks at the mm -hmm. Greek for Logos and says, we misunderstand it if we don't understand that it's relational. Yes. And so I just started looking at this question of the Logoi, the, the wisdom that's in the little particles of matter, mm -hmm. um, what if those are also relational? Um, mm -hmm. Reading uh, this wonderful Tunisian Lebanese philosopher, René Habachi, uh, who refers to Emmanuel Mounier and, and says matter is relational, which is also an idea that's coming out in modern physics. So just um, this whole idea that relationality at the base of everything, one, point yes. one. Secondly, your comment about the theological basis of politics. Yes, yes so, it comes uh, me, it's not me. Yes, but uh, Olivier Clément's first book, Transfiguring Time starts by saying the modern myth of progress is a naive, secularized form of the biblical expe expectation of the Messiah. As Sergei Bulgakov so well demonstrated, the Hegelian dialectic inherited by Marxism is a merely a degraded form of Trinitarian theology. The philosopher's insistence on personal history and experience may be traced back through Kierkegaard, mm. Luther, St. Augustine to St. Paul. And mm. so it's very, very close to what you were saying about mm. um, the, the mm. thoughts starting in St. Paul. And so mm. my, the, just my last comment on could we find a different approach to things uh, where mm. we use them without owning them. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a wonderful medieval legal concept in the West called usufruct. Yes, yes. And the usufruct, where you have the right of use of something uh, without owning it. So I, that's a concept that I've often wished we could get closer back to. But thank you. It was just extraordinarily uh, interesting. I think, th thank you very much for, for your comments. Daniel here, you know, guy in the red, you know, he knows the, the, the idea of logo, logos and logoi, like he is, he is very well into this. And, and especially like, you know, because it's coming from Stoics philosophy, as you know, and, and in Philo of Alexander, you have this idea uh, as well. Uh, I, I, you know, you were quoting Olivier Clement. I think he's brilliant, uh, brilliant author in many ways. And, and it should, you know, she, he, he deserved to be read more and to be known more. But, you know, his ideas, what he says, you know, Mounier and Bulgakov, that is, like, it is there, you know, the idea that certain things are sort of a originally Christian going in a wrong direction. Right, you know, like, uh, uh, for example, philosophy of history of Augustine and all sorts of things that Hegel didn't even mention in his huge project, for example, you know, just simply uh, is, is astonishing uh, for me. But the but idea of a uh, uh, certain medieval, uh, uh, medieval uh, uh, thoughts about the way how we use things, it's, it's really explained in Agamben's highest poverty because he's discussing the Middle Ages. He's, it, there is other books, uh, Opus Dei, on liturgics, which is brilliant in many ways. It's, it's so like, so why I didn't know that as a student of theology, why nobody told me that sort of a things? Like, like why he is like philosopher who is writing about this? That, that was my frustration with him. Uh, but I think uh, in highest poverty, the, the whole idea of so-called, you have that in uh, radical Franciscans, uh, Peter, uh, Peter Olivi and Gerald O'Donis, 
and John Milbank is calling them like Franciscan conundrum because uh, idea that we can uh, use something and not own it because church is owning that in in uh, uh, in that context in Franciscan context because he says you know uh, we are serving church we are we have church we have monasteries we have buildings but we don't own it church is use you know we are using it church is owning so what is what is problematic there is that they they write first contract in the modern sense so you know they write contract with the church the church is owning and we are using it in that sense it is almost like a proto-capitalistic trick that it's inscribed there because the problem of usus uh, that's what agamben says in the book the, the uses of the body is very complex historically this is this is i think almost a, a, a touch and go that we should discuss in, in theological circles I, th I think there is something there that uh, that that we should tackle with with all utmost seriousness and i think he's onto something that's unfortunately uh, 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 he says that other people will develop it that's what he says in his, in his last book he said you know that's that's perhaps up to us uh, to kind of dig through it but thank you very much for your for your thank very, you very thank nice. you thank any other questions or not but well, i can't i can't or it from here Okay. Allergical reaction. <laughs> I like this silence. But the idea that all the modern concepts of theory of the state are secularized uh, uh, concept from theology, it was developed by uh, uh, interesting, uh, one of the most pro thought provoking uh, uh, his German historian of Jewish heritage called Ernst Kantorowicz. He was a right wing Jew. And as a young man, they will come and fight with the communists on the street. You know, he kind of like it. Uh, uh, and, and he wrote the book, Two King's Bodies. And this is like overview of medieval uh, political theology. And it, it is a very important text that will give uh, uh, all kind of answers on your research uh, if, if you're doing, because what he tried to show in that book is this, that that right of kings, which was called divine right of kings, was secular already in the Middle Ages. So that king, who is a king of Germany or Britain or, or, or England, whatever, he had two bodies, one his own body, and the second body is his the state or kingdom, which is, if you think a little bit, it is Christ, right? It's almost like secular, secularized parody of Christ as a person, as a king, and church as his body. So, you know, idea that you can, we cannot king, kill the king was like, oh, because he's there by divine right. It's just medieval invention, which is parodic, uh, theological parody. Right? So, you know, there is a whole history of this, you know, what, what, what you say about this sort of, a, you know, secularized theological concept. It, it, it is very, very interesting that it's there. Uh, uh, and Hans Kantorowicz, he ran away to States. It was so interesting. I like the story. And he was forced to sign uh, McCarthy, you know, during the time that McCarthy was there, so-called hunting on communists. And the, McCarthy was... Uh, asking him to sign that he's not communist, right? And he says, do you know who I am? Like, <laughs> do you know who I am? Like, I'm like, you know, I, I fight with communists physically. My arm was break a couple of times. You know, like, do you, you know, I'm a professor. I'm not communist. Like, and, and he didn't sign it, actually. <laughs> That's the whole thing, you know. So very interesting character, you know. So, yeah. It's a slightly controversial from the uh, uh, humorous uh, comment. Oh, good. It says uh, the more complex society becomes, more micromanagement is necessary. Isn't it the case that only a spoiled baby boomer is finding this fact frustrating? We have to Sandra Simovich. Who? Sandra Simovich. Oh. I'm not sure that, that this is the 
worthy to even command. It's, it's, it's not like that. This is not a Gambian's position. This is not simply what he says. It's not about com complexity of society that need micromanaging. But... Okay, moving on to the next. Yes. Uh, there is a thank you for the presentation from uh, Ben McCrimmon. Oh, uh, Ben was my student, so. He, he asks, would be able to give us a good place to start reading for those interested in engaging with Agamben's writings? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think knowing Ben and his interests, I think Kingdom and Glory would be a very good book. First of all, because it is a part of his Homo Sacer or Homo Sacer uh, 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 project that I didn't spend so much time just because time did not allow me to discuss. I think Kingdom and Glory is very good because it starts with a very, very profound theological argumentation. Uh, uh, and, and it goes to the critique of medieval Thomistic uh, 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 understanding of politics and, and the whole idea of how reception of Dionysius of Areopagitus was received in, a, in, in a Western thought. I think that that will be knowing, you know, if someone is interested simply in theology, I think this, this, is, this is a, a good start. Uh, uh, it is a complex reading, but I think worth it because with reading a Gambian, you, you are always rewarded. Like as much as something complex to read, but you know, every time, like when you go through that text, it's important. Uh, I, I think that uh, his book on method, uh, I think it's always good to start, not at the beginning, but simply to have it, uh, it's called signature of all things which is a phrase from Paracelsus, because uh, uh, when he talks about Homo Sacer or, or concentration camp as, as a paradigm for modern politics, he, he, he's not saying us like, oh, we live in concentration camp. This is not what he, he says, this is a paradigm, because he thinks in paradigms, not, not in a Thomas Kuhn sense paradigm, but in Michel Foucault paradigm. So in, in uh, a signature of all, of all things, he has a three chapter, which are, I think, very important because what is archaeology for him? Like uh, archaeology uh, is a history of history of philosophy. It is a sort of a started with Kant, but it is a, a project sort of extended by Michel Foucault. So uh, uh, what, what Agamben is doing, he basically says, I'm using Foucault's method but I kind of try to enrich it. And he said, he says, I, I want to complete and, and, and comment Foucault's thought. In Homo Sacer's book, he says, that's what I want to do. So uh, Signature of All Things is, is a method book. This is how I'm doing things. That's what he said. So I think that's that's good thing. For me, uh, 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 of course, the romance is, is very interesting. I, I like it very much. Um, uh, I think Homo Sacer, book not the whole project that's the whole is good and opus day for example can be interesting that's on liturgy uh, highest poverty is good but kind of complicated so kingdom of kingdom and glory and there is a small tiny book it's called kingdom and the church that he this is a lecture that he lectured in paris in cathedral and he's talking about church so i think this is this is quite interesting one what is church for him uh, uh, and why does it matter? Uh, uh, I think thought-provoking book that it's a small, tiny, you know, the, 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 most, the small books are the most dangerous one. Did you notice? It's like, you know, how many people really read Thomas Aquinas? Like, I, I have to do it because I was studying the Jesuits, so we, you know, they forced us to do this. But like, but you know, apart from students, who is reading really? But the small one, there is the one called Mystery of Evil, and it's dedicated to it is about Benedict, Pope Benedict, when he stepped down as a Pope. I think that, that can be very interesting, Ben, for you. But also, it's, it's a good intro in his thought, uh, because in, in some of his books, uh, uh, when you read them, you will see precision and depth and beauty of his investigations, but also his arguments. I think that's, that's uh, uh, what matters. Thank you. Can I ask a question or any other question, online questions? I can't say another. OK. okay. Could you say a few words uh, or a bit more about the relationship between philosophy and theology in Agamben? Because you, you um, well, the first question is, has he written an essay or explicitly about this topic? Mm -hmm. Or is it kind of more implied in his work? 
because you said, I think, um, at the beginning of your talk that he it's a considers procedure. philosophy to as the master discipline and to some extent use a theology instrumentally or and you know in theology when theologians use philosophy instrumentally then the whole theology is influenced by the philosophy yeah. the philosophical model they use that's mainly a you know, yeah. liberal protestant thing yeah. rather than developing a christian philosophy yeah. uh, or there may be more it does not mean you know like thomas is you know uh, uh, reading Aristotle, you know, and it does not mean that it's Protestant, you know. No, no, but, but he also transforms it. Yes, so, of course. And so, if it's not the other way around, when you're a philosopher, you use theology instrumentally, mm -hmm. then who will not argue that, in a way, I'm, this is really a speculation, I'm not, not yeah. a theory yeah. or anything, <laughs> I don't know a gun enough, yeah. but who will not say that, in a way, his whole philosophy is actually heavily influenced by theology? Even if it's not fully acknowledged, I, I, yeah, so I, that's I, kind of my impression. Yeah. I could never yeah. write I, about it because I yeah. haven't read enough and haven't thought about it enough. But somehow that is the case. No, <laughs> would you? Would yeah, you? I think first of all, I think it will be excellent PhD for some of the students here who are listening. Yeah. You know, I think yeah. that will be a really, really good topic. There, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, it's like when we use word that he instru instrumentalized. I'm, I'm not always comfortable because he's using poetry and and uh, uh, literary theory because he's reading lots of literature and poetry but also uh, 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 his first degree is actually in in a legal theory you know okay. so 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 for him he always claimed that he's a philosopher and he will, he said that you know in a couple of times in public you know uh, debates and and uh, but i think it's in in his case as I say, I try to almost trace it for myself when I was reading it, that it is almost that theology for him is investigative procedure. It is a kind of almost like a method that he used because lots of things that happen in the theological thinking uh, are simply anticipate certain things that will happen later. You know, and, and for example, uh, uh, he, he, he would, uh, uh, he will discuss Thomas Aquine's book on uh, uh, on kingdom. Thomas wrote, you know, his political sort of things, right? And half of the book is about angels. You know, Thomas is just half of the book is about angels, and idea is that when Thomas is sort of a using pseudo Dionysius, you know, the whole uh, you know angelic hierarchies and everything. What Agamben is trying to prove that basically he, he made angels like Thomas Aquinas made angels like heavenly bureaucrats who are in charge to governing world instead of God because God is reigning but not governing. You know, angels are governing, the, you know, they are the governing structures. So in that sense, it is almost like political yes. thing that, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and I'm not sure that he's completely wrong, Agamben, you know, but, uh, uh, but I think he's understanding how theology is working. And, and it's a different than, for example, Foucault. Foucault is, Foucault is also read, reading lots of theology, but the way how he interprets them, they are sometimes questionable, not sometimes. F uh, when Foucault reads theology, he's very good to find some interesting unknown texts or unknown, like Gregory of Nyssa, some sort of interesting sexy quotations, like, oh gosh, I didn't read this, like, I didn't know that. And, and that's the reason, you know, but when he tried to interpret things, it's sort of a, he has almost like a gender, but with Foucault, with, with Agamben, the way how he read authors, there is certain consistency and, and almost like, that he will apply the very same reading to Dante or to Pashukanis, you know, legal theorist of, in Russian legal theorist of 20th century who was a communist or whatever. You know, he will have the same, or Heidegger, you know, the same almost like, I hate to say, like intellectual honesty to, towards text that, that and, and in that sense for him, I think theology is simply a, a significant place where things happen, yes. you know, and, and I think, what bothers me with this is that theologians are not able to see this. You know, why do we need Italian philosopher who is all the time telling this stories? Like, you know, he's like in every book, like Opus Dei, when he talks about liturgy, 
and and he says that liturgy is the only place where you are you whom you're supposed to be and you know explain things like i didn't read that in shmeman you know or you know or or uh, uh, whatever like you know the the french uh, uh, russian orthodox theologians in a way or or catholic you know but 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 i think it's uh, uh, the way how he talks about it this is what sort of makes it interesting yes so i think no no easy answer on, on your question yeah i think but what is interesting if if he's a philosopher and his argumentation method procedure uh, paradigms are coming from theology it means that theology is a master discourse yeah, it means that theology like almost like you have those apologists like uh, today they try to defend uh, uh, god's word like bible with scientific proof right that you know god really created the world but you know na, 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 na. but then it seems that science is a more primordial discourse than god's story right it's almost that you need another discourse to defend god's discourse I think there is something wrong in that, but with Agamben, it's opposite. So well, that's my interest as well. I think that in a way, the theology is <laughs> the way how he treats yeah. theology and how he read texts and 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 you know read authors and sources. You know, that's that's what that's he he is the one one of the great authors that he really reads sources. He read you know yeah. fund, you know that's primary that's sources. That's 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 that was it. Probably perhaps theologians. They um, uh, do exactly uh, what he suggested. Uh, they disactivate these uh, 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 arguments. Yeah, uh, perhaps. Because, yeah, because you see, uh, philosophy is uh, so amb uh, ambivalent uh, yeah. uh, tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you can you can uh, turn it. Um, upside down yes you know, yeah. and uh, uh, to prove the same thing yes so the uh, theologians uh, they just disactivated yeah uh, and uh, of course uh, uh, when we read these things uh, there are a lot of um, uh, uh, sources of, uh, 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 probably to my mind they come to the surface like a uh, grand uh, increase uh, gr inquisitor. Gr grand inquisitor. inquisitor yes yes so it, it is theology just uh, yeah. turned upside down yes yes right okay. so uh, or um, uh, the modern um, reading of christ's temptations mm -hmm. Yeah, so, cousin uh, yeah. yes. So uh, turn the, the stones into, uh, into um, uh, bread. So uh, the um, food crisis. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Uh, bow, uh, uh, worship me. Mm -hmm. um, the crisis of uh, uh, power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, well, uh, uh, your angels will take you. Uh, uh, crisis of uh, crisis of. Um, uh, science mm. you know so <laughs> mm. people try to play into play with the uh, marriage theology mm. and uh, philosophy but, I think since the beginning of the time yes yeah. uh, I, I think uh, you, you're right but I think with, with Ngambin's case I think he would uh, 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 you know he can almost confirm that that sort of a very disturbing paradox of our time that the best theologians are not actually theologians like Dostoevsky you mentioned I mean he's the best theologian of 19th century if he, he go in that you know in that story like and, and Agamben like you know he's writing about poetry or like when you read for example Dante like if you put uh, Dante as a theologian and, and the poet in the same time you know how how much more Dante is is, is really our contemporary today and 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 you know he can you know he transmits certain truth to us that that it's beyond sort of a academic theology so in, in that sense Agamben is very useful and and I think excellent interlocutor I think it's it's just simply something that that we can learn from him I think that's that's what my argument is all about no doubt about it he his way of thinking is very very elegant as yes. Said. yes so precise yes <laughs> yes we just talk about it that he has some yeah. Some, some sort of a almost seductive, you know, that you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yes.
And the advantage is that many more people actually read the Gump. If yes. you were a theologian, it's yes. explicitly categorized yes. as a theologian. Yeah. You know, a uh, few people will actually read. Yeah, and yeah, because it's also yes, you know, Nietzsche loved Dostoevsky. Yes, yeah, of I course. Not a Christian. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. But, you know, if, if you know, like, if you don't like Dostoevsky, like, what? That's like, <laughs> wrong. <with> you, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so that's that's a thing. Freud. Too, yeah, he, he loved Dostoevsky too. Freud. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, they all, all. Any other question? I can't, I really can't see it through here. No, nothing is uh, nothing is new here. Yeah. Okay. Well, hour and a half. Brilliant. <laughs> no you fun. just like, like it was planned, you yeah, know? Sure. And, it was planned. And <laughs> well, if there are no further questions, then I would like to thank our speaker again for yeah. a really brilliant talk. Good. I thank you very much. You you know, normally, at, at the end of the talk, you can have time to stop it. I, I would have liked you to continue for another <laughs> hour, honestly. <laughs> uh, no worries. So, thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, good to be here. It's, as I say, first time here. It's, it's a beautiful building, beautiful people, you know. And I think something is wrong with connection. Beautiful people on the other side of the screen. So, you all look so beautiful. I don't know what's going on. Why is that? So, <laughs> yeah, still mainly an, an online event, I'm afraid. Yes, no worries. <laughs> no worries. So, thank you very much. <laughs>